because we need to understand a little bit of something about once we get water onto the land surface, it doesn't just stay at one isotope composition. All right, we need to pay attention to the fact that there are additional isotope transformations that take place when water falls onto soils. Here's some data that comes from an older paper by Chris Barnes and Graham Allison. Um, and they basically plotted for us here the hydrogen isotope composition as a function of depth down through the soil profile. So here's the surface of the soil. And here we go down about 1.6 meters in the soil here. And uh, you can see that there is a very distinct gradient in the isotope composition, whether in this case it's the hydrogen isotope composition, um, uh, of, the, of the soil water itself. And this led to a whole bunch of research that they and other people did to basically start to characterize how isotopes within the soil profile might vary. And they wanted to know that for a couple reasons. They wanted to know how the sources of water that ended up in the groundwater, these guys were from Adelaide, Australia, um, the groundwater system there was a very important one in addition to the Murray Darling River. But they really wanted to know could they trace the source of water that goes into the groundwater aquifers around the Adelaide area. And they said we need to understand because Adelaide is a Mediterranean environment, dry summers, wet winters, how that precip that falls onto the soil is modified once it falls onto the soil. And so they did a bunch of experiments to really characterize that precip and then follow it into the groundwater system. And basically what you're seeing here is the effect due to evaporative enrichment as you go to the top of the soil profile. You're going to see this over and over again in many soils from around the world. So as you get closer to the surface of the soil, the water that remains in that soil gets isotopically heavier. Back to our principle, right? The lighter ones are leaving first, the heavier ones are staying behind. So the more evaporation you have, surface of the soil, the heavier the soil water that stays behind is going to become. And you get these nice isotope profiles. They don't always look this nice. Sometimes they really look terrible. Um, but this is a nice one. I give you, I gotta give you the best case first, right? And then we go to the next slide, which is, uh, well, not quite, the next one after this. Um, but this, this is the kind of stuff that Allison and Barnes worked on, and they basically started to build a model and we're going to kind of build a soil water profile. So they said, we start with a dry soil. We put some rain on it. And if that rain is of a, of a basically a known isotope composition, we're going to get a, and if it saturates the profile, we're going to get pretty much the same water value all the way down through the profile. But obviously, sun comes out, evaporation tar starts to take place. You get, you apply the heat, you get uh, the lighter isotopes leaving, and you get this evapoconcentration effect near the top of the soil profile where the water closer to the surface is going to be heavier than the stuff below it for which it came from. But of course, we don't get profiles that look like this, as you saw in the last slide. We have to apply steady state diffusion, which is going to happen during the evaporation process. And that gives us the green line that we actually have on this, on this profile here. So they worked on a series of papers to provide us with information about if you know what the starting isotope composition is, you know what your thermal properties are, you know what your bulk density and your porosity of your soil are, you can actually predict what the hydrogen and the oxygen isotope composition of your soil water will become. Hugely important, hugely important. I work on plants that live in soils, right? Their work was so important for me because I could go out and I just had to have a couple of isotope values and I would apply their models if I had some climate data and I could predict what my profile should actually look like. And I didn't have to go out and keep measuring in them every time. So they developed some models that were very important for me to predict what I expected to see in the soil pro profile and then link that to the plants that were actually rooted in those profiles. So if you work on soils and isotopes of soils, Chris Barnes and Graham Allison will be papers that you're going to end up reading a lot of. They developed all the theory. They did all the experiments. Uh, let me go to this next slide, and then I'll answer your question. Um, Look at the depth of the profile stuff that they worked on. No, your eyes don't deceive you. These are seven meter. These are columns of soils that they brought into a greenhouse, right? And they, they put them in a pipe, 
and they put all these different soils that they collected in these different pipes and then, and then they basically rained water on them of different isotope composition and they had these little windows they could open up into the pipe and they could go in there and they'd apply evaporation, they'd put heat, they'd will allow different environmental conditions, sandy soil, clay soil, whatever, and then they would develop these isotope profiles that they then could develop their theory around. So this one, this was a seven meter soil column, right? And I saw this in the greenhouse. Graham took me in, in there and showed me when I was, I actually went down to visit uh, him years, years ago. And the greenhouse was just full of these soil columns. You just couldn't believe the amount of work that they did. And they, everything was done in a greenhouse where they could apply all these, the right humidity, the right temperature, et cetera, and develop these profiles. And then, they, and then they modeled them. And they used them to basically give a bunch of set of predictions. But here's some empirical data. The hydrogen and the oxygen isotopes. These are the two scales above here. And you can see that there's these isotope excursions, as we expected, more positive the closer to the surface that you get. But then they got this goofy profile here. Look what happens here. It, it, gets, it come, becomes evaporatively enriched as you get closer and closer to the surface, and then it turns back on itself. It becomes isotopically heavy, or uh, more depleted, sorry, as you get. And they, at first, when these are measurements. And they, and they thought, what the heck is going on here? And you have to know something about Adelaide. And you have to also know something about the soil, the soil that they were working on. This was a sandy soil. And what they were able to demonstrate for us is that when you apply a lot of heat to a very porous soil, the evaporation doesn't occur off the surface. It occurs inside the soil profile. Because it heats up and it's really porous. And so they were getting evaporation from inside the soil. And while some of that evaporate was on its way out of the soil, it got stuck on some of the uh, particles. So the lighter isotopes got stuck on the soil profile, and the soil profile went back in the other direction. And they were actually able to measure that. That was really cool that they were able to see that, because now they can incorporate that by knowing what the porosity of the soil is. They can give you a predictive framework that maybe sometimes you're going to go enriched and then depleted. And if you're working on something that lives in that soil, they actually have been able to develop a model that actually explains some of those. So this was a really cool exercise. You had a question. I was just wondering, for this model or this picture, doesn't it only work for soils that have not a big like groundwater intrusion or are not in an area of a stream? Or Exactly. So these are really, they're developing these models and they're developing these profiles where there's no other additional subsurface water source that could come in and affect it. You're absolutely right. And then I was also wondering, since the bacteria or microorganisms, I mean, they change the oxygen and entropy, so it's not a fact for those people. It doesn't account for those, and man, those are hard to account for. Yeah. There's been a few people that have tried to make very small scale measurements on what the microbial isotope effects are, particularly on the oxygen isotopes. And they are, they're so small, they're huge for the microbe, because the microbe's just a little organism, right? So it's a big effect on the organism, it's a small effect on the soil water. You can't actually see it. And they've tried to measure it over and over again. Uh, it does make an effect for the, the, what the oxygen isotope composition of the microbe itself is. But for the soil water that remains, it's, we can't measure it very well. So it's really been a tough thing. People have asked that same question, and they haven't really been able to resolve it. All right. There's also a couple other goofy things in this profile worth looking at. Um, and if you work on soils, these are the kinds of things you're going to start to see. Um, this might be the beginnings of an old evaporation front. It used to be up higher. Gravity, right? So it got evaporatively enriched, but it kept sinking in the soil profile. And then maybe another rain came along or something and pushed it down. So many times you can get these squiggles of, that go down through the soil profile here that represent a legacy of other either inputs or evaporation events and don't realize that that's real. These are the kinds of things that really you see a lot, particularly in poor soils or sandy soils. Right? They can really, really be important. And these basically represent the legacy of past inputs or past sorts of events in the soil profile. And that's why if you work on things that live through the soil profile, you've got to measure it. 
You really do, because these kinds of things, these nonlinearities show up all the time. They're really, really important, all right? So this is kind of a warning. I'm going to go past this one. We end at noon, right? I run out of time every year, John. OK. Let's link this to plants. So let's jump ahead a little bit and talk a little bit about if we start to take water in the soil and link it to what plants are using, um, what are the things we have to pay attention to? Jim and I did a bunch of studies. When I became a postdoc with Jim, I was one of the first people that started working on water uh, and plants. And when we, we started looking at the literature and no one had actually said, hey, let's take this tool and start asking if we can interrogate plants and, t and have them ask us, uh, tell us where they get their water from. But what we had to do was a set of little studies to basically say, well, what do we sample if we want to know where plants are getting their water from? So we did, of course, some greenhouse investigations. This is just showing you the hydrogen isotope value here. And we extracted the water. Um, we knew what the isotope value was, was of the water that we actually put onto the soil. Um, and then what we did is we extracted the water actually out of different compartments in the plant. So we went to the roots, all right, or well, we went to the soil first. We went to the root, we went to the stem, and then we went to the leaf. And we basically said, ah, we can't sample the leaf because it's obviously not a faithful uh, recorder of what the isotope value of the source water is. So if you sample the root or you sample the stem, and you'll see it will depend on the kind of stem here in a second, you can actually reconstruct what these plants are actually getting. The other thing, cool thing that came out of this paper is that we didn't know at the time that we did this experiment whether when plants took water out of the soil in, into their root system, whether there was a fractionation event. We didn't know. Actually, there was one paper out there that hinted that it wasn't happening, but we actually really didn't know. No one had done the experiment and said, is there fractionation during uptake? And these investigations showed us, no, there isn't. That what's in the soil and what's in the plant, at least until you get to the leaf where it's evaporatively enriched, is a pretty faithful recorder of actually what those plants are actually using. So that was hugely important for us, because that meant that we didn't have to worry about a biological fractionation at the root level um, that might influence the isotope composition that the plants were actually taking up. We did have to pay attention, though, to the kinds of tissues that we sampled, the, woody, the stem tissues. I showed you the stems in the last graph. What this shows you is stems of different ages. And those different ages are representing different stems in different maturity classes. Very young stems that haven't completely developed their, all of their conducting tissues or fully suberized. You know, suberin is one of the compounds that plants make to basically become watertight and not lose water from their tissues. And young stems are not as well suberized as older stems are. So basically we said, you've got to be careful. Not all stems are created equal. We'll go to the older stems. Many of the times those stems have bark on them. They're not green. So they may not have, many times green stems have stomata, or what we call lenticels, which are places where water can actually leak out of the stem. The, less, the take home lesson here is, don't sample green tissues. They're not going to be reflective of the water sources that your plants are actually taking up because they're losing water, many times through stomata, like leaves do. And they can become isotopically enriched and not a faithful recorder of the water that your plants are actually using. So this becomes a bugger of a problem if you work on herbaceous plants or grasses. Right? They're, probably, they're all leaf. Right? And so if you work on grasses, you have to be creative and go and you probably have to sample. We've done this a lot. You, sample, you go down to the base of the plant and you're sampling those, those roots that are feeding the leaf biomass above ground. So you don't sample the leaf, you sample the root itself. You can get around the problem, but you just have to think a little bit about what your plant material is. Um, and make sure you're not sampling enriched material. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, it's really tough. You can sample the roots, but you just have to go, go collect a bunch of them because there's, you know, there's very little water in each one of those roots. But you can do it. You just have to increase your sampling size. All right. So this seems like simple stuff, but we didn't know this before, so it's really affected our sampling considerations. Um, now, I just told you that our data 
um, showed us that there's no fractionation during water uptake. But I want to throw in a caveat here that, that there was wor some work done beginning with Guanghui Li and this diagram here and subsequently with a couple other people that if you work on plants in saline environments, they are goofy. All right? They don't do what other terrestrial plants do. And of course, you know that mangroves basically are living in salt water. And they build their root systems and their tissues in a different way. And many mangrove species have a root tissue that prevents the salt from coming in. It's almost like an ultra filter. Well, they're building a fundamentally different kind of root membrane than a terrestrial plant is, all right? Because they're going to exclude the salt. They don't want the salt when it comes in. It's osmotic shock. We don't want salt. We don't drink salt water, all right? It's not good for us. So not good for plants either. So those plants that build a salt excluding root membrane, look what they do isotopically. You can see in this experiment that Guanghui Li did, Guanghui Lin rather, what he's done is he's plotted the hydrogen isotope value in the stem that he's extracted it from and the hydrogen isotope value of the source water and he because he knew what it was he measured it and he asked the question if the plant is faithful to what it took up it'd fall in the one-to-one -one line right no fractionation but particularly in this case here where he has a salt excluding mangrove all of the source water values are isotopically heavier than what's inside the plant itself. And what he and Leo Sternberg proposed, as shown here, I've written it down, is that when that water comes up to this root membrane, and basically an ultra filter, the bonds are breaking in such a way that to get it through the membrane that the lighter isotopes go through faster. Remember, those break first leaving the source water more enriched and consequently there's an isotopic offset and it's mostly because you have an ultra filter here that is not allowing some of that heavier isotope to go through all the time and so it leaves more of the heavy isotope in the source water than actually makes it into the plant all right this has been documented now by a couple of different investigators including Dave Williams and some stuff that he has done Dave you're going to meet next week so in plants that live in salty environments, there can be an isotope fractionation during water uptake. So if you guys work in saline environments, you work on mangroves, just know that this is out there in the literature, that there's some pretty interesting data come from plants that live in salty environments. And they don't behave exactly the same way as plants that live in terrestrial environments. So be aware of that. Yeah, Ellen. You know, there, there has been a little bit of work done on acidic water, um, but it's really equivocal. You know, it's all over the place. So there's not a kind of a global conclusion that we come, can come to yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's talk about just a, just a couple of rules here. Um, if you're working on trying to link then water sources to what the plants are actually uh, using, Build a local meteoric water line. Rule number one, right? Then get out there and identify all the sources that your plants possibly may use, all right? And all the sources. You know, when I started working on redwoods, I, started, I was very surprised when I started going, oh, I've been measuring soil water and precipitation and stream water and groundwater. And I had neglected to start looking at fog. And then I realized, and I'll show you an example, that fog was a really important part of the hydrologic cycle. And so when I started measuring that water source, I realized, ah, I need, that was a piece of the isotope picture that went into the plant water source. So don't underestimate collecting all of the potential water sources out there. Do, things like that. They might be important for your system. You never know. Um, there may be differences depending on the community that you're living in. If you have neighbors versus no neighbors, if you're growing next to a neighbor of the same species versus other neighbors, we know that plants respond to their neighborhoods. So if you're working on plants, many times you want to go out there and characterize your soil environment and your plant environment depending on what your neighborhood actually looks like because competition is real. 
and plants will move their roots to different parts of the profile depending on who they're competing with or not. So realize that those effects are real. Those are biological effects that can manifest themselves as isotope effects. So if you're working on plants and water, don't forget about that. And then there's a bunch of other things that we have, we're not even going to get a chance to talk about is plants do a lot of things. Jim referred to this when he was introducing me this morning. Plants also are, they're just not cooperating with basic principles sometimes. They shift things around in the soil. Things of hydraulic lift, for example. They'll take water up from one level and move it to another place in the soil and let it go. So what if you have a groundwater value that's different than your soil water value and the plant decides to move water around, right? All of a sudden, those soil profiles become very confusing. And so the plant behaviors can also play an important role in affecting not only what your source waters look like, but what your plant waters look like.